Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and uh, welcome to our first fall Knowledge at the Group seminar series of the year. Fall. My name is Michael Hartman, and I'm a professor of uh, human resource management at the Group, and the uh, newly appointed principal of the Directors College. So it's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, and I'm very pleased to engage here with members of the DeGroot Network. Uh, my dean, uh, Dean Waverman, uh, faculty colleagues, and of course, uh, alumni and friends. Uh, as you know, we've been hosting the Knowledge of DeGroot seminar every month for almost a year now. Uh, they've proven to be a great way to share uh, information, exchange ideas between faculty, members of the business community, and others. Uh, this morning's event, is presented in partnership with the Directors College, a joint venture between the Conference Board of Canada and the DeGroote School, uh, offering Canada's first and foremost chartered directors program, as well as specialized programs for board directors uh, and directors. Which brings me nicely to this morning's speaker, John De La Costa, a founding member of the Directors College. John has worked over two decades as a business ethicist and expert on trust and organizational values. He's also a best-selling author, the founder for Ethical Orientation, the Center for Ethical Orientation, and uh, uh, as I found out over a coffee last week, also I think the founder of an interesting slogan that we all know in your marketing days, the slogan Freedom 55 is also in your background as well. Uh, John has also consulted to governments and business around the world on issues related to trust, integrity, and strategy, uh, and is here this morning to speak to us about the future of business, what's needed, uh, and what is next. So with that, John, please, over to you. Michael, thank you very much. Just a joy to be here this morning. Great, thank you. Dean Waverly, thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor to be in this facility, to be before you, to have this conversation with you, about what is next. Of course, it means we need to understand where we've been coming from and where we are today. So that's a little bit of what I'd like our presentation to explore with you, uh, that I'd like to explore with you this morning. I prepared a bunch of slides, uh, but I feel like I'm in presenting in Canada, which is with a population that is very narrowly banded between east and west and requires an awful lot of movement and facilitation for engagement. So, what this allows us to do is hopefully have a conversation. Uh, I designed it to be presentation with Q&A, but maybe we can get some questions, maybe we can get some comments, even as we go through this material. This puzzle of what's needed and what's next is first of all a strategic issue. Any of us who are in business need to be thinking about that. We need to be looking at the horizon. But all of us, in addition to being business people, are also citizens. And so when we look at the state of the economy, when we look at the state of society, when we look at the state of our ecological kinds of issues, we're also looking to the future in regards to that totality, not only to where we are from a business perspective. So I'd like to start with a little thought experiment. I'd like to have you all imagine that you are mountain biking somewhere on the Bruce Trail, let's say and it's March of 2007 and you've just been promoted at your company and your career trajectory is going through the roof and you're exhilarated and you're just roaming through the countryside up and down, up and down, up and down and you hit a tree root. You go for a tumble, you're wearing a helmet but the concussion is such that you go into a coma. You're out cold, March of 2007 with your career right on the launching pad. Now, because you're really highly regarded in your company, you're well taken care of, top-notch medical treatment, all, everything else, and basically, you're out cold, you're asleep. Now, usually I don't ask people to imagine being asleep at the beginning of a presentation, but think about that. March of 2007, now imagine waking up March of 2014, this year. What's happened? Right? So first of all, you have to regain consciousness, you've got to regain muscles, you begin through friends and family to find out what's gone on while you were away, and happily your company has kept its office door for you, its office uh, facility there for you. So 
you've got that to go back to, but what do you find out? What's happened since 2007? This is the interactive part. <laughs> 2008. And what happened after 2008? I mean, that was traumatic enough. But what's happened since? What experts call the aftermath. What, in historical terms, mirrors very much the stock market crash and the Great Depression, and we are still in it. Now, you go back to work, and you've had an understanding of the kind of social trauma, the unemployment numbers, and everything else that's been happening in society. So you go back to work. What do you find? How different is the workplace? One of the things that led to the financial crisis was the bankers who were responsible said really short-termism, right? We, we were looking this quarter, this deal, couldn't, let, you know, couldn't stop dancing, was what they said when they were before Congress. Couldn't be the first one to give up the dance. So there was a real immediacy. If you went back to work after that seven-year gap, would you find that the emphasis on short-term had changed at all? Or is it just business as usual? Only more so. Isn't it even more? aggressively short-term? Would you find that, again, one of the things that broke down were the incentive structures, right? People were rewarded for taking risks without responsibility for what the consequences were, and we saw it happen. Is there a different incentive structure in place? Has CEO salaries moderated at all? Actually, no. The trajectory that was there before has continued. After one year, 2009, where everything went to hell, CEO salaries not only resumed their growth, but continued to up outpace standard, uh, the, the inflationary rate or the rate of, of increase for the average worker by over 20%. There was 20% versus 3% growth for the individual year by year. Now, society's been through a huge trauma We've had unemployment, we've had austerity programs, we've had uh, 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 budgets that are unable to deal with education and infrastructure from a public perspective. And we saw pre-2007 that there was more and more commitment to corporate social responsibility. What happened post-2008 to corporate social responsibility? We know profits recovered, profits recovered within one year, and then profits became record profits after 2010. What happened to corporate social responsibility spending at a time when society was in desperate need? It went down. It not only went down in absolute terms, but hugely down in terms of percentage profit applied to corporate social responsibility. So again and again, if you look at employment, if you look at all the kinds of issues that fomented the financial crisis, those patterns are still there, governance. Have we changed the way boards operate post-2008? Not even as much as we did after Enron. So it's business as usual, only more so. So the starting point of this conversation for me was really to deal with three questions. Does that mean, having now had six or seven years, having had this huge trauma to society, that what's next is just more of the same? because that seems to be the trajectory. Is that the best that we can do? The second is, whatever reality is emerging, we are in a different space today than we were pre-2007. Do we have the core competence? Again, I'm thinking from an ethics perspective, but also from a strategic perspective, to navigate this very uncertain, complicated new reality that we're in today. And then the third question is really the one from an ethicist perspective, that keeps me up, which is, do we have the responsibility mechanisms in place in our companies to deal with this new kind of reality? Remember when Alan Greenspan stood before Congress in uh, the fall of 2008, as the financial crisis was really unraveling, one of the deregulators, he was the head of the Federal Reserve, uh, and in, in part saw what had happened, and he proclaimed at the time that he was shocked by what had occurred. So this is the chair of the Federal Reserve, who the University of Chicago uh, Economics Journal called the greatest central banker of all time. 
and he confessed. He said he was shocked because he had discovered a flaw. Anybody remember what the flaw was? It's very important because his flaw was that self-interest was not strong enough to self-regulate in ways that would protect the investment of shareholders. That's huge. That self-interest, the way that he had imagined it, was not robust enough an idea to self-regulate at a time where people really needed to be paying attention to the interests of shareholders. They looked after themselves, not their own shareholders. Now, when I heard that statement, I, you know, a lot of people condemned him, a lot of people condemned the bankers, and there was lots and lots of fault to go around. But I began to look at, actually, the business ethics profession. Because if we think about where business ethics had come, something that began in the 1970s, 80s, as a formal discipline, it had moved into this Mr. Bean kind of compliance, mumble, mumble, jumble, you know, you're doing this, you're doing that, you know. And most of us, how many of your organizations even have business ethicists? Not many in Canada. A lot of organizations have compliance officers. Well, compliance is after the fact. It's a different type of tallying. It's an important thing to do, but it's like saying law enforcement is defined by police forces. It's not. You need the judiciary, you need the lawmakers, you need all those other things. The ethics function needs to have that kind of robustness to it, but that's actually, so when I saw Greenspan's statement, I thought, you know who's responsible for the financial crisis? Ethicists. Because we're the ones who should be enabling the capacities for self-regulation, and we blew it. We did not provide the kinds of checks and balances to make that work. But when I talk about business ethicists, I'm not just talking about a role. I'm talking about that aspect that each of us as managers, each of us as business people, each of us as citizens, each of us as human beings have as a capacity and as a responsibility. None of us are in this alone. Even in markets, we rely on customers, we rely on each other. There's all sorts of, we know how important trust is. So there's a dimension of ethicality that resides in every single job description. So, if we look at this issue of broken down trust, you can say, well, you know, it's actually not a universal problem in business. So I get a lot of feedback. Having talked to people about this, they say, you know, we're not the bankers. We didn't do what they did. We're living the consequence of their reality. And I had the opportunity to actually work with bankers. In 2010, the people who run the Davos Conference, the World Economic Forum, invited me to participate as a panelist on trust building. And what they were specifically looking to do were create systems and processes for the financial industry, for bankers, to re-earn trust in the global economy, because Davos, Davos looks at things from that globalization perspective. So the question was, the bankers have no credibility right now. The whole sector is hugely important to the economy, but business people, the public, are quite suspicious of it. Regulators are quite suspicious of it. How do we rebuild trust? So I'd ask you, how would you, what would you recommend? Interesting problem, huh? It's a strategic problem, it's an ethics problem, it's a cultural change problem. What would you recommend? If you had a banker in a room, some of you are bankers, what would you tell them? Yes? Well, some people have talked about not only uh, have there been very, very few prosecutions, which is an issue, but what's happened from an employment perspective? About 40 million people lost their jobs globally, and because there has been no job growth because of the financial trauma, the shortfall currently sits at about 200 million jobs globally. People can't get access to work. So that's a social problem. It's a problem for many of our young students who are coming through the universities, who are getting education, who are doing all the right things, and can't quite. But the interesting thing is that 97%, Georgetown University did a study, 97% of all the bankers who were in place in 2007, in 2012 were still on the job, still getting their bonuses, still within that, that system. So accountability is perhaps what 
the, the issue that you're raising. So we would want to impose or expect some degree of accountability. What else would you say? Interesting problem, because it's our problem too, yes? So we want a change in behavior that demonstrates that responsibility. And we want to see tangible things. They need to convince their clients that they're there to really help them. Yeah. And that's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Nobody trusts them. So we were going through this process, and these are really important suggestions. We were going through this process, and what it turned out happened was the thing got sort of sabotaged or derailed because it became a PR exercise. They had some McKinsey people there, they had other public relations people there, and they kept thinking it was a PR problem. They had to change perceptions. And Michael Porter makes this point in his Harvard Business Review article about shared value. He said, it's the perception that business doesn't care about society that we have to deal with. Well, I didn't think it was a perception problem. I think it was a behavioral problem. I think it was an accountability and responsibility, a, demonst a demonstration of care, a fiduciary care kind of problem. Um, so here they were in the midst of it and in a state of denial. Now, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of organizations that have gone through ethical crises or ethical mishaps, and this is a consistent pattern. We shouldn't blame the bankers. We should think about it even in our own terms that people in the top of organizations, even when they acknowledge that there's a breakdown, tend to considerably underestimate the damage that they caused and the degree of disconnection that occurs with their audiences and with their stakeholders. So this is a big lesson for us, that we have to take seriously the consequences, not from our perspective, but from the perspective of people who have been harmed by decisions that we've made. That's what accountability is. It's not adding up, it's caring about what the consequences are at the other end. Now, the same year, I had an invitation from a group in Chicago to help the US Conference of Catholic Bishops on a trust project <laughs> to try to recover credibility for the bishops after the huge, huge scandal around, uh, around uh, clerical abuse and pedophilia. And here, I expected, because I'm trained in theology, that there would in fact be a different consciousness, that there would be a kind of humility at play in this leadership cohort around this issue. And perhaps that there would be new ways of dealing with the issue of behavioral change, of dealing with the issue of accountability that the bankers were resisting. And in fact, I found the same resistance, the same proclivity the same willingness to go to PR as opposed to deal structurally with the kinds of issues that allowed that problem to be created. So again, it's not to blame them. Although it's interesting when you look at these pictures and you try to figure out what the demographics are of these bishops and bankers, that too is an issue for us to be considering in terms of their reform in terms of bringing in other ideas and other contexts. But both of them were concerned about trust, but unwilling to transform themselves to actually earn trust. What we found in both instances was that their mindset continued to operate pre-2007, pre-crisis, very much like that thought experiment I had us go through. Our own workplaces are like this, our own society is still locked in this mindset. They wanted to protect their status and their institution, even at the expense of the people who were most vulnerable. And I think this is the thing that most unsettled and upset me as I was going through this process, both with the bishops and the bankers, was kind of like, oh yeah, it created a problem. But a denial, an inability to see what the human costs of that problem were, and the fact that it was often the people who had the least resilience, the least resources, who were most severely impacted. This is a big lesson from the, from the ethics literature. How do we grow wisdom after making a serious mistake? How do we develop 
a new sensibility, a new, a real willingness to change that allows us to overcome that resistance to transformation. And what the literature tells us is that we need to be affected. We need to be touched at the level of our humanity. We need to allow the story of what happened to the people who have been impacted by our decisions to enter into our hearts, into our heads, to cause us discomfort, to cause us to question our certitudes. And then out of that, out of that grief, out of that sense of, you know, it's not about guilt, oh, I screwed up, I'm so sorry. It's not that. It's actually being affected, allowing ourselves to be as human beings in empathy with those people that we begin to come to some serious transformation. What I had recommended to both groups, and the bishops did a, mod a modified version of this, was that in fact they should do truth and reconciliation processes. Not again to lay blame, but the bankers should go out, they should go out to some of those communities that were devastated by the mortgage crisis. Meet some of those people, meet some of those hardworking people who were doing everything they were supposed to do to make ends meet, who lost pensions, lost homes, lost security, lost everything for decisions and bets they didn't make. Not necessarily to take on all of that, but because we know that from a wisdom perspective, we need to hear those stories in order to challenge the supremacy of our own story. We need to hear their version in order to be able to modify our version. Bankers didn't want to go near it. The bishops, to their credit, a very, very small number, decided to go that route, to actually say, you know what, we better talk to the victims. But imagine not having had that as their first response. To be affected. The other thing about both organizations is that they assumed trust operated as it always had, as a top-down kind of reality. That it would be, it belongs to the office. I'm the CEO. I've earned my authority. Yeah, even if I make a mistake, the office itself has sufficient social capital to regenerate that trust. Or I'm a, you know, I'm a bishop, I'm a cardinal. I've reached the pinnacle of my organization. That authority has millennia of, uh, of cachet around it. And that's not the way trust works today. Trust today, even in Canada, we look at institutions with real doubt. We used to give the benefit of a doubt. Now we start with the doubt and want proof that they deserve our credibility. And we don't look for the top to tell us what's credible. We, in fact, look more horizontally. We look peer to peer. We look at what other experts or people that we respect in our own peer group are saying. This is especially true for the under 35 group, in part because of social media, in part because of their sort of different uh, acclimatization, culturization as they were growing up. They don't look top down for solutions. They look peer to peer. Tell me if you believe it, then maybe I'll believe it too. So they completely miss this fundamental transformation that's been happening there. So here we are in this rigid mindset. But does that mean we can't change? Before I talk about this slide, one of the things that's helpful to remember is that uh, Thomas Kuhn, in his book on scientific revolutions, on the structure of scientific revolutions, where he coined the term paradigm shift, made the point that we don't actually change paradigms in crisis. Crisis is rarely the stimulus for deep change. Why? Well, because we think it's an anomaly, right? Just the very definition of a crisis. It's, it's erupted, and we always talk about recovery, right? Let's go back to where we were. So our orientation when crisis occurs is to survive and to get back to where we were. Usually, paradigms begin to change when there's an opportunity to see patterns at play when we begin to see the consequences, not in the heat of crisis, but in the more sort of, not even, I don't want to say lethargic, but in the more deliberate kind of reality post a big, big trauma. Neil Fligstein is a sociologist who has actually studied the patterns of corporate control. So he's gone back, he's looking at this through the US filter, 
and he's gone back and looked at corporate governance since the US Civil War in the 1860s. And what he's found is that there's basically a 40 or so year pattern of governance where it goes through adoption, development, ultimately some kind of rigidity or imbalance kicks in, and then the governance mechanism, the governance model loses its credibility, some kind of crisis occurs, and eventually then some new mode of governance is created. So 1860s, the war was actually when the United States industrialized. It's really when management became a profession. And it was largely in service of you know, the railroads and all that other stuff that had to go into war material. By the end of that 40 year cycle, by the turn of the century, what did we have? We had the robber barons. We had the excess. We had a breakdown in terms of that balance in society. We had unbelievable wealth and unbelievable poverty. And eventually the system couldn't go on. So you had a restructuring, in Flickstein's term, that had uh, terms that had to do not with the concentration of wealth in the hands of many, but the development of more markets so that there was a more democratic approach to wealth. And we had stock markets taking on more and more importance to the economy during that next 40 year period. And we can really see the end of that with the stock market crash in 1929. Now the depression and the war, kind of an, you know, an anomalous period. But then there's another 40 year cycle coming out of the war where you have the grand bargain, the contract between management and labor, and you have the growth of the middle class, and you have that whole sort of, you know, that golden era of economic growth in North America in that post-war period. But then you had problems beginning to emerge in the 1960s. In the early 70s, you then had inflation and the uh, shocks of the oil embargoes that hit in the early 70s. And then all of a sudden, that grand bargain began to fall apart, and a new cycle began. And that new cycle in Fligstein's chronology is around financialization. It's where the banking sector, which used to be about 5% of the economy, began to apply its metrics, its growth denominators, and eventually now represents about 25% of the North American economy. So you had this financialization cycle that began around 1971. So we can see the pattern. It comes in every 40 year cycles. There's a crisis in confidence that compels something else to be born. We can ask ourselves where we are now, but the interesting thing about this 40 year cycle, again, coming at this from a theological perspective, is that this resonates with wisdom that we've had in our ancient scriptures for, again, for millennia, for at least uh, 3,500 years. In the Hebrew Bible, there's a law in Leviticus that stipulates every 50 years Systems break down. It basically says even the best human systems eventually become rigid and start to do damage. <coughs> and the damage manifests itself as inequality, enslavement, and injustice. And every 50 years, you gotta blow it up. It's called the Jubilee, they use a better word. You blow it up and you start over. You, gi you give freedom to everybody, you release debts, you put the land fallow for a year to recover, and then everything starts again. Again, you don't have to have a theological orientation to just recognize that people for thousands of years have been seeing this cycle around human systems. That we create really good things, that they eventually become rigid, and then they start doing damage to us. But that ultimately inequality in Fligstein's analysis is what agitates some kind of governance change. So if we begin to look at what the cycle was like in 1971, what was going on then? Well, the Cold War was in its zenith. For those of us that were around, it was unclear who was going to win that Cold War. It was unclear how long that Cold War was going to last. And there were many indicators that the United States or that North America or that the capitalist free market kind of uh, society was not necessarily winning that particular race. You had this phenomenon of stagflation, just no growth and, and growth had disappeared. The, uh, oil, uh, the oil embargo hadn't hit yet. That really raised inflationary pressure, but it was already clear that the economy was not self-generating an awful lot of growth. What was happening in the 1960s? A huge movement around civil rights. People were saying, I want a share of this. So the people that were excluded, we had 
uh, the civil rights movement in the United States, which was largely African American. But we also had the feminist movement in the United States and Canada, where women were saying, hey, wait a minute, we've not been included, our voice hasn't been heard, we're not proportionally represented in you know, the banker's ranks, the bishop's ranks, for example. Uh, our salaries aren't equal, why? You know, so you had this agitation occurring around human rights, basically, that had those manifestations. We also had the dawning of an environmental movement. It was in the 1960s that we began to see things like the, the river in Cleveland, Ohio, catch fire because it had so many pollutants in it, and to see the kind of devastation that was occurring in forests and all those other sort of pollution issues came to mind. But the formulation that was created around governance at the time was really meant to protect freedom. If we think about Milton Friedman's declaration in 1971 in the New York Times that the only social responsibility of business is business, is to investors, is to shareholders. He, you know, we can argue and, uh, and you know, thousands of, of academic articles have argued about this, but the point is that he was speaking at a time where capitalism became the surrogate for freedom where free markets was the only guarantor against this alternative system that was really threatening everyone's horizons at the time. So we need to respect that there was an awful lot of intellectual energy put into this notion that the governance cycle of maximizing returns to shareholders ensures our human freedom. So the question we have to ask ourselves is where are we now? If this gave us the theoretical and philosophical orientation for governance in 1971, can we expect that operating system to be valid today? We've seen some of the consequences of relying on it, but what is going on right now? Some analysts have said that, well, first of all, we can debate whether the Cold War is over given what's happened in the last year in the Ukraine and the way that the Soviet, uh, the Soviet Russians, sorry, the way that Russia is flexing its muscles these days. You can argue, you know, the way China has ascended and, and represents this hybrid of capitalism and communism. You can, we can really argue whether the Cold War is actually ended or taken on a new phase. But people have said, you know, today we live in a civil war and the civil war is in each household that what we demand as a consumer in terms of our low prices drives down our own wages. That's the interesting quandary that we're in today. So, you know, some people will call it the Walmart effect. Everyday low prices has an everyday cost if your neighbor was producing that particular item or if your child is trying to get into that particular industry stream. So the civil war, this idea that it now actually has been appropriated, that we are experiencing this conflict. It's not geopolitical, it's geo-household. This idea of stagflation, you know, uh, my wife and I spend our summers in Italy. This was the first quarter since the war, since the Second World War, where Italy had deflation. And they're going crazy. They're not the only country in Europe going through this, but uh, Italy, like one of the things that's very famous about Italy is that everybody takes the summer off, right? Ferragosto. It was, uh, it's been a tradition since the end of the Second World War that basically Italy closes down for the month of August. The big crisis this summer is that of 60 million Italians, 30 million did not take a holiday. The president was pleading with people, please go. Why? Because hotels were having to let staff go, restaurants were letting the deflation that's been building up has kicked in. They are not the only country going through this, but this issue of uncertainty plagues us all right now as we go forward. The key issue is that just as there was a civil rights movement in the 1960s, we're seeing the burgeoning rights movement reassert itself today from an inequality perspective. The difference being that the inequality is being experienced by people who previously had been included. So you have the declining middle class, you have university graduates who can't get jobs, you have university professors who are hired on a part-time basis and barely make living wage. So it used to be that education 
was a guarantor of some kind of success, and we're seeing that sort of grand contract break down. This is the first generation in the United States where the American dream is not a dream anymore. People do not believe that the next generation will have it better than they've had it. We're dealing with climate change. The interesting thing is that I think the issue of freedom never goes away. Every generation, every society is always wrestling with that. There are too many threats, too many pushbacks on it. But if we think about the defining social problem that we face today, it actually has to do with fairness. It has to do with how do we create a, fair, a fairer economy, fairer outcomes in terms of where wages and, uh, are distributed inside of organizations, fairer outcomes in terms of the way people get to participate in the economy so we don't have this huge gap around inequality. So our reality today requires quite a new orientation. So for time, I've now lost my presentation. Let's see if I can connect to the App Store. I don't need this. Let me go back and see if I can get us uh, to just move ahead. When you hear the problem being inequality, what's the solution to that? So the thought experiment that I was going through this summer as I was trying to wrestle my way through this was that coming out of the Enron catastrophe, we learned that organizations needed to develop more transparency. If we were to look at it from an equivalent perspective today, when we're facing these kinds of problems, of civil, this is from the World Economic Forum 2012 report on risk to the global economy. And they talked about civil discontent, youth unemployment, inequality, all the things that we know that are occurring. If you investigate, if you interrogate these issues, What's the common denominator and what is the common solution? So as I said, with Enron, after Enron, we all got on a transparency regimen. What is the regimen for today? This is really the pivot point for my presentation. It's rediscovering the idea of proportion. In the same way that transparency brought us back to a real fundamental aspect of our human wisdom, which is being honest with one another, that honesty counts in an information age, proportion is the skill set that applies really throughout organizations that requires us to dig back into our human understanding of what it means to be in a social reality and an economic reality together, and to begin to develop the skill set of proportionality. To a degree, the last 40, 45 years of maximizing shareholder response has actually obliterated proportion, right? Because maximization, by definition, is not proportionate. It's selective. It chooses one thing. So as I was thinking about proportionality and how if we think of all resilient and thriving systems, they all have those balances and those checks built into them. And I was trying to think of, can you think of one natural system or human system that can operate on 24-7 maximization? Can you think of anything? So I was looking at, you know, we've got Olympic athletes up here, and they're a really interesting model because they probably compete at this level, you know, for an hour after preparing years and years and years to do that. But how much can they go all out? If we think of hockey, when they come on the ice, they go all out for about 40 seconds. Then they run to the bench to catch their breath, they're sweating, they're dying. Everybody can go out and do their bit for 40 or so seconds, but they need time to recover. We've lost that complete sense of proportion in our business conversation. So I work with boards, I work with CEOs, and the language that they use as they define their problem is always around, yes, this is an issue, this is an issue, but of course my responsibility is to maximize returns to my shareholder. And that was written in 1971 as a principle, but that is, I think, what we are seeing questioned being recalibrated today.
So it doesn't mean compromising what the shareholder receives, but looking at this in relation to the whole, understanding that the economy is not a self-sufficient system, but operates actually embedded within a natural ecosystem that is showing us what its limits are. I mean, every week we get data about how we're coming closer and closer to that threshold point around climate change. And climate change is probably just one of many, many indicators. The kinds of species extinction that we're looking at, the kind of ongoing deforestation that we're looking at. I mean, last week in the Globe and Mail, the article was about how Canada is the number one lumber cutter downer in the world. So, you know, we look at the Amazon, we think other people have problems. How are we as a country contributing to that? At the same time that we're doing those kind of lumbering on a mass scale, we also have the oil sands creating toxic uh, carbon emissions. So, you know, as a country, as we think about these issues, proportionality, where does it enter into even our uh, civic discourse? But there's a noun aspect, which is it's part of a relation, but there's also a verb. There's a dynamic component to proportionality, which is adjusting to its proper relation. So I'd like to just talk a little bit about proportionality in terms of both its history and then some of its applications to business and then turn it over to you for some questions. So this idea of proportionality, again, is not new. As I said, it resides in our human wisdom. Uh, the image up here is of a Franciscan monk named Luca Pacioli. And for those of you that have studied accounting, you may recognize the name because he's actually called the father of accounting. He learned, he was working before he became a monk for Venetian traders in the uh, 16th century. And the Venetian traders were interacting with uh, Muslim countries and they brought back from the Arab world an understanding of math that had not existed in Europe at the time. And he invented double entry accounting. He's the one who formalized our modern balance sheet. And he called it in his book about math, divine proportion. The divine, you have to give it to him because he was a monk. But he, what he was basically saying was that proportion was the key to creating justice. Proportion was the key to making beauty. And numerical proportion, the real appreciation of an asset and the real appreciation in balance of a liability created the possibility to navigate all the kind of economic issues that those traders were involved in as they were looking at risk in their particular reality. Included in that proportionality was this idea of the universal man. Now, this is a very famous image. Most of you will recognize that it part, it's part of uh, Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks. Luca Pacioli was the math teacher who taught Leonardo. He's the one who laid out the principles of math, including the principles of perspective, that led to this idea. But proportionality, from a Renaissance perspective, puts us in touch with humanity. It puts us in touch with an economy that puts human beings and the scale of human needs at the center of the transaction rather than at the periphery of it. So we have historical things that we can go back to. But let's look at what it looks like in the actual attribute. If we were a manager, and if we were being asked to think proportionally, what would that involve? It would mean looking at the whole, right? And so we often complain as managers or critique managers for being short term. This is looking at the short term, yes, but within its engagement long term. It means seeing the relationship between parts so that we see the connection between our economic activity, our social activity, our employee practices, our values, and our environmental performance. It's recognizing, because it's proportional, that we are embedded, that we do not operate with autonomy. Proportionality is a kind of compromise, but so is most ethics, so is most wisdom. It's a give and a take, not just a maximizing take, not just a maximizing give, but a balance between those. That there's a synergy that emerges from restraint. And this is where proportionality adds to the argument that Michael Porter and Mark Kramer made in this notion around shared value. 
they said there are huge profits to be made for organizations in attending to social problems and in attending to environmental problems. And I think that's true. But there is also an equal and corresponding responsibility for shared restraint. That there are some shared sacrifices that have to be taken on. If we go back to the bankers and if we go back to the bishops, this is what they didn't get, was not that they should be diminished, but that they should show in tangible ways that they are sharing in the grief, in the uncertainty, in the displacement caused by their particular decisions. It's not a cosmetic thing, it's not a PR thing. When they can share that, that's where the affective aspect of transformation begins to kick in. Proportion is about justice. And if there's one theme that I would hope you take away from this is that corporate social responsibility needs to evolve from a business perspective to corporate social justice. We need to hold ourselves to that standard. And we can see how this will impact governance. It will require us at the level of boards to do what boards are supposed to do, which is to take account of the full picture, to understand how the organization thrives or fails within a society that thrives or fails. We can see how it impacts decision makers at the managerial level. All of a sudden, a different kind of skill set has to be born in. Now, to think of this as instantaneous is wrong. Remember, we go through 40-year cycles. We're in the early days of trying to recognize what proportionality is. And there are people all over the world who are working on this. I was at a conference in Bangkok earlier this year on moral capitalism dealing with this issue of how do we take the vitality of capitalism and tame it to allow the human being to thrive and to not be an afterthought. Uh, there's another organization in the UK called the Blueprint for Better Business, and this is gonna be my final point. And uh, this was an organization created post-financial crisis in the city of London, where they were trying to think about how do we develop the moral sensibilities in the financial sector, but in business overall, that lives up to these responsibilities that seem to have gotten neglected when the financial crisis occur, occurred. And they came up with a series of principles that commit companies to things like human dignity, to deep sustainability, to real sustainability, not the cosmetic stuff that often shows up in corporate social responsibility. And uh, I've only seen the top line of this. KPMG has done a study of the first wave of companies that have been signatories to this. So companies like Unilever in the UK, which always seem to be on the front end of these things, have signed up. And what they've shown, what KPMG is quite excited about, uh, and again, I haven't seen the data, I've only seen the top line for this conference that's coming up next month, uh, is that the commitment to proportionality at this level, to this inclusivity of multiple objectives, is what they call profit neutral. Which is, it doesn't help, it doesn't hurt. So again, we're in the early days of learning a cycle. I take that as a huge positive. What it means is that we all can be experimenting with proportionality, knowing it's not gonna cost us anything, but knowing that it's going to have the kinds of social impacts and environmental impacts that begin to give us the lessons we need to learn for what's coming next. Questions? Can I take the lead with a question for yep. you? Uh, I was in, uh, in the UK, working in the UK, 2008, 2009, and had a conversation with the education editor of, of, uh, of uh, the FT. And uh, as we were going through just the first front wave of the crisis, and we, we asked each other, are we at the precipice of a paradigm shift? Or two years from now, will this be the new normal? And to build on that little note of optimism, uh, what have you seen sort of uh, emerging from board discussions around sort of the proliferation of corporate responsibility reporting, as well as the embracing of all these terms such as shared responsibility, natural capitalism, sustainable capitalism, that Unilever and others are embracing? Is that actually starting to become a movement? So there are two things. One that gives me optimism is that the research on directors, this is US data, shows that about two thirds now acknowledge more than, that fiduciary responsibility means more than just shareholder returns this quarter. That a larger perspective, that a more inclusive perspective around social issues, environmental issues is important. 
So the majority are now, in part for all these things that have been going on and, and the kind of wisdom that I think emerges as, the, as they wrestle with those uh, questions at the board level, two thirds are there. However, that same group, it's only a tiny, 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 tiny minority that know how to do it. So what ends up happening is they say, yes, we have to work on this, but the default is to use the criteria and the skill set that got them into that position. So I, the, the metaphor that I use is muscles, right? They have done exercise regimens all these years, lifting the financial muscles, making sure the profits were there. That's what's made them successful. What they've not done is the balancing work, lower body on you know, ethics, on core, and so it's an exercising thing. So some of that has to be that we almost have to exaggerate the concern around proportionality to offset and to develop the overdevelopment that we have at that level. I've also seen boards for the first time, and, uh, and Manulife was the first board that I know of in Canada that did this, where they actually created an ethics audit committee on the board. Um, so this is something that already exists in, uh, in the US iteration because the ethical orientation is a bit more developed there. Not necessarily more ethical, but there's just a tradition for ethics uh, that's a, a bit different than ours. But I found that very interesting. So I, I know that they obviously operate in the US. There may actually be US pressures that are, are forcing them to think in these terms. But to actually have an audit committee at the same way that, the, you know, that there's a board committee that looks at executive compensation or that looks at the, uh, at the financial audits, somebody is now paying attention to the ethical issues. Another board that I've worked with here in Canada actually introduced a framework for their managers who are coming to the board or for anybody who comes to the, to the board where they created this little pinwheel diagram of the five elements that constitute integrity from their point of view. And any time a presentation comes to the board, the board expects that that pinwheel will have been addressed, that the five elements that are there will have, had, uh, will have been brought into the discussion sure, and conversation. The title, the Blueprint for Better Business? Is that what you're Blueprint, saying? The Blueprint for Better Business, oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. And the neat thing about proportionality is that when we think about it from a human perspective, we can all get to it. It's not alien territory, it's recovering something that exists within our bailiwick of human wisdom. I actually, and again, I, uh, these slides will be coming out to you with some notes, but I actually did a comparison of how proportion works versus transparency, because one of the things we learned about transparency was that it went, you know, on the, on the one hand, a word like transparency is incredibly obvious, right? Like how did we ever have not transparency? But it became a big deal after Enron and WorldCom and Nortel and those other collapses. And transparency went through this evolution where it was first about disclosure, make sure everything gets out there. It eventually morphed and it became about dialogue. It became about honesty because what we're trying to get at is a better understanding of complexity. So transparency itself morphed and evolved. And I see proportion working the same way. The first level of proportion is to undo disparity. But eventually, as we get into it, as we begin to develop the skills around that, proportional conversations begin to lead us into conversations around fairness. And, you know, uh, lots of my consulting work right now has to do with values. Organizations saying, you know, we, our values are tired or our values are not sinking. Well, often it's because elements like fairness, the elements that would be appropriate in today's reality, are not brought into that conversation. Yes? Well, uh, there's a movement that began in Toronto uh, that's now gone global that tries to formalize the ratio between CEO pay and average worker pay. So it's largely uh, a backlash to things that have been occurring in the fast food industry and in the retail sector, uh, where you know people can often have two full-time jobs and still not make ends meet because they're almost below minimum wage. So again, if we think about the evolution and the development of these things, this program was launched last October. And what they do is they rate organizations, they get investors to think about that proportion and that they're beginning to bring research to it to show how, uh, you know, when, when that is a proportional 
uh, connection, when there's a relationship between those two numbers, how those companies can thrive, how can they succeed. So there's learning that occurs, but that's one example where this dynamic of proportionality, people are, it's a, it's a way of demonstrating accountability today. Well, Fligstein, in his analysis, says that it's always a breakdown where power becomes too rigid and the inequality, in a sense, erodes and, and creates some kind of crisis where that power has to be reappor uh, reapportioned. I would say we were not into that reality yet. I think we're still having the debate about where power is certainly concentrated. Yeah, well, we, historically we know that and, that, and that's actually what's been happening. So the reason uh, uh, the Thai government sponsored this conference on moral capitalism is that because Thailand is predominantly a Buddhist country and they have certain economic principles that have, have never been part of the global conversation. Thailand is very proud that they've always been a non-aligned country. They were never colonialized. During the Cold War, they navigated between the US and the Soviet Union and never sort of got themselves too caught up in it all. They have their own problems, you know. Um, but the idea was that there's a principle that comes out of that tradition called sufficiency. And there's a, a lot of rich balancing that occurs in sufficiency because it actually speaks to issues that we need around sustainability. So once we begin to think with a proportional lens, a lot of things change. So one of the things I was playing with was, you know, we, we live in a time not only of uncertainty, but of austerity. Austerity has become the norm, just like uncertainty has become the norm. Well, austerity feels like bad medicine that we want to get out of our system. But if we think about austerity in a proportional sense, if we think about austerity as sort of the dress rehearsal for what sustainability requires in terms of restraint, then we can begin to recover again an ancient virtue of frugality where what frugality means is that we use things, but we really value them. They're not disposable. We want, with frugality, to use and to invest now, but in a way that also generates and protects some kind of legacy going forward. So what this word proportionality gives us is a different entry point into a lot of the different issues that we are struggling with as a, a politics, as a, a body politic, as a as a corporate reality. Uh, how would you reconcile uh, that, that growing number of CEOs uh, or uh, executives that uh, recognize the need for proportionality, the rise of the unpaid internship? Uh, I think that that is, internship should be a synonym for unfair, right? I mean, for, in the way that it, that it has been deployed. Um, but the way that, that part-time work would also fit into that category. Uh, so I don't know the specific answer to that. Like I would like to ask the question of organizations that have been signatories to the Blueprint for Better Business to see how they dealt with those issues. But they are making a specific commitment to human rights. So it may not have all worked its way through, but those would be the kinds of questions that would be engaged in this. McKinsey did a, uh, a, a C, they, every year they do a CEO, a C-level survey of about 1,500 people globally who are chief executive or chief financial, chief operating officers. And uh, in 2009, so the first year after the financial crisis was really obvious to everyone, they asked CEOs kind of a reflexive question, how important to your shareholders are civil rights, are human rights? And then they asked how important is it to the market? And so they did the same thing for ethical products. So, you know, sustainability and issues around green marketing, about 70% of the public, from a CEO perspective, thought that was important, and about half of investors thought that was important. So that was an interesting one. But human rights was about a third of the public cared about human rights, and this is a human rights issue. It's a, it's a form of enslavement, basically. Um, about a third of the public, 6% of investors Again, these are CEOs projecting what they think the market expects of them. So that 
tells me that the discourse about human rights just has not been part of the board conversation. So these organizations that have signed up for the blueprint or for these sufficiency programs are at least bringing the language of human rights and civil rights because it never goes away. You know, there's, if we had more time, there was really interesting stuff that um, one of the scholars tracked Leon Sullivan's ascension to the GM board after the civil rights crises in the 1960s. So you have to remember Detroit burnt down. There were all these riots. Uh, Nader was attacking GM. The uh, black community was saying, you know, look at all these white guys on the board. Here's a company that employs, you know, 95% black workers on its assembly lines. And GM put Leon Sullivan, he was a, a black pastor, a reverend, onto their board. When he showed up at the board, it was uh, the, 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 the board basically turned its back to him. They saw him not even as a token, but as an intruder. And to Sullivan's credit, he said, I, you know, there's nothing I can do to change the GM culture, but I can use the podium of the GM table to begin to look at civil rights globally. And he did, he launched the Leon Principles, uh, the Sullivan Principles, uh, which actually were adopted by many companies and it was part of the pressure point that, that was brought to bear on apartheid in South Africa. Um, so it just, you know, historically, we always have to learn this language and, this, and the, the dimensions of what human rights are. So today, it's not necessarily that the exclusion happens on a basis of race, but it'll happen on the basis of internship. That's a rights issue. And this is the kind of language that we need to bring into the conversation. Well, what's interesting is that if we look at that 1971 start point, uh, a lot of things have happened since then, right? We've had this technological revolution, we've had globalization become a phenomenon. But the other thing that's happened is that business used to operate as its system of integrity and government used to operate as its system of integrity. The corporate mindset of maximizing return has become a political ideology. It's become a political ethos. So um, there's a whole thing that Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher, talks about our social imaginary, which is where do we, you know, where do we make moral meaning? Not as business people, but not even as citizens, but as human beings in a society. And that imaginary are like, what are the principles that we use to calibrate right or wrong? Well, what you can really track is as a result of this maximization pressure, it's become part of our political imaginary too. So, uh, you know, there are regulatory issues, there's all sorts of things from a political perspective that need to be thought about, but more than anything, it's returning to what government used to do, which is government used to be the justice carrier, right? The legitimacy of government rests on justice. So we didn't get into this conversation, but disproportionality from a political perspective does what to democracy? Destroys it. So there are people who are really worried about the state of democracy today. Thanks, everyone. So thank you, John, for very engaging and insightful. It, it sparked a number of other questions, which I hope uh, if a few of you would uh, still have some moments after the event to talk a little bit additional about. I, I, I want to present a little token of appreciation as well. Is it proportionate? It's proportionate. <laughs> I was going to use it. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, John. Just a joy to be with you this morning. Thank you all for attending, for coming out.